Uh, probably some of you know me already, so my name is Enrique Gonzalez. I'm the TA at least for this semester of the class. And um, I'll be teaching today, if you're taking RF2 as well, I'll be teaching RF2. And so to, this class is supposed to be an inverted class, so you already probably watched the lecture for this, uh, for, for this class. So we'll, we'll go over the lecture a little bit uh, quickly. And if you have some questions, you can ask them. And probably we'll do some exercises, or if you have an, any questions about the CAD assignment, or maybe installing install the software if you're having any, any problems with HFSS or EDT, yeah, it's, it's the way it's called now. So uh, let's do a review uh, on the probably in the, on the last lecture that you saw online, it was mostly about dipole antennas, right? And how they behave when they are close to a, a ground plane, right? So the effects of uh, getting a dipole antenna, an infinitesimal dipole antenna, and getting it close to a ground plane. Also some image theory uh, considerations and what happened with, uh, okay, so with the monopole antennas, right? Sorry. Okay, so let's, let's just begin. So some image theory considerations. So previously, right, in, in the initial lectures, you were studying how uh, dipole antennas uh, radiate, radiate, right, in free space. So you were considering that the antenna was placed in free space and it, doesn't, it didn't have anything close to, close to it, right? So it's just a conducti conductive wire, or maybe the infinitesimal dipole is just a a uh, small current that is impressed on, on a really small, uh, uh, thin and conductive uh, wire, and then it basically, basically just radiates, right? So image theory uh, helps to simplify the problem of how a, a dipole antenna or any, mostly any antenna could behave close to uh, a, a conductive uh, let's say, in infinite plane, right? So in this case, it's going to be the, the, the ground plane. That is going to be an infinite ground plane. So why is this important? Because any obstacle that you place close to the antenna or any, any dielectric or conductive material that you place close to the antenna, obviously, you can think that it's going to change how the field is distributed close to the antenna or maybe if the, that, uh, the dielectric or conductor is pretty close to the antenna, it's gonna affect how the radiation pattern at the end is, right? So it can improve your radiation pattern or it can, it can just worsen your, your radiation pattern, right? Depending on how you design the, 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 the extra components that you're placing close to the antenna. So, more us usually, we see, like if you think as your, the monopole antenna or the antenna that you, can, that you have in your cars or in the past, uh, you could see in, the, in, the, in a car, right? You had a, a, a really long stick that just was going out of your car, right? So that basically was for picking up FM or AM radio. So that's uh, an example of an antenna or a dipole antenna that, that is placed in close proximity to a, a conductive uh, plane, right? You can think of the conductive plane or the metal plane as, as your car, right? So that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's an example of a ground plane, right? So any radiation that goes uh, into this ground plane, since it's, we can think of this uh, ground plane as a metal with uh, infinite conductivity, it's a perfect electric conductor, right? So it's going to reflect most of the energy that is coming from the antenna, right? So in order to analyze this uh, radiation uh, pattern of the antenna uh, in the far field, we assume an inf infinite, uh, infinite PC plane or perfect electric conductor. And then we analyze uh, mathematically uh, by image theory how, it, how the far field is going to be by studying basically an image of that antenna that we have. So we have an antenna place uh, at a certain distance of the ground plane. So we assume that uh, uh, you can think of it uh, as an example, as a mirror. So we can think of the image of that 
antenna is going to be placed at the same distance far away from, from the from a symmetry plane that is going to be your 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 ground ground plane, right? So this equivalent problem gives us the same solution at the far field if we eliminate the ground plane and then we assume that we only have these two antennas. The first antenna is just our, our, our original antenna and then our image antenna uh, is going to produce, we could say this pretty much the same field as, uh, at least for now, that the, our original antenna, so the sum of those two uh, fields produced by the antenna at one specific point in the far field is going to be, the sum of those two fields is going to be our total field, right? So let me try this one more time. I think it's not going to work. Yeah. OK, so as you can see here, probably some of you understood this, uh, this, uh, this figure from, from the lecture, right? So we have our actual source. So let's just do this with the mouse. Let me see. Let me just enter the presentation mode. OK. OK. Probably I can do it now. OK, so you can see here that we have our actual source, right? So this is our infinitesimal dipole, a vertical uh, oriented dipole, the ones that we've studied, we studied already in, in the lectures and in, in the homeworks. So this dipole antenna is placed here. We have our, this is our ground plane, right? So the field that is coming from the antenna, so those fields that you see right here, are going to be reflected at this uh, interface right here, right? Since it is, it is a perfect electric conductor, it's going to reflect all of the energy, right? There is, no, there is zero field in this area, right, that we have here. So at any point in, if we study the, the far field of the, of the or, or the electric fields that are, or the electromagnetic fields that are generated by this uh, dipole antenna, we can study, uh, for example, two different points. And in the point P1, the total field is going to be the sum of the, this direct path that we see here, right, plus the reflected uh, field that is coming from the ground plane, right? And in P2, we have the same, the same situation, right? So we have two paths or mo uh, several paths that the, the field can take from this uh, location to the other location, right, in point two. So one important thing that you, you need to remember is that the reflective wave, right, is going to be polarized so in such a way that the tangential field, right, in the PC is equal to zero, right? So we know that we have to maintain the same boundary conditions, or we have to meet, or yeah, we have to meet the boundary conditions at, at the perfect electric conductor. So the tangential field E, the tangential E here, is going to be equal to zero, right? Or the summation of those, right? It's going to be continuous. So we have to maintain the maintain that boundary condition here at the boundary. So as you can see here, this, uh, for example, if we see if we analyze this path. We have that the polarization of the E field is in this direction, right? You can say in the theta direction. So once it's reflected, the reflected wave needs to maintain a polarization such that the tangential field here uh, at the interface is equal to zero, right? So basically, just if you decompose this, uh, this field in two components, right? You'll have this component plus this component. And if you decompose this field in two, you have this component and this component, right? So the component of this field in the tangential direction with the PEC is going to cancel with this one, right? So that's why we end up with this, with these directions right here. So let's see, we're going to erase this. Erase here. Yeah. Okay. So are you following me with that? I think it's pretty clear, right? So that's why we have then this. Uh, we can consider then a, an image source, right? That is placed at the same at the same distance. Okay, yeah. That is placed at the same distance h uh, uh, from our uh, interface at the ground plane, right? So this is our virt virtual source. It's an image source. So it physically doesn't exist, but it's a, a mathematical uh, artifact. That, uh, yeah, that we can use or element that we can use to in order to study 
easier, easily, more easily the problem, right? So what I was talking about the polarization is, right, so you have to, it is really important to uh, remember the polarization of the source because this is a vertical oriented dipole, right? So the polarization of the field is going to be in this direction, right? So in order for the image to maintain the same uh, tangential field or in order to meet the boundary condition here at this point, you need to have the same uh, polarization as our source in order to cancel the tangential field at this point, right? So we can study uh, an equivalent problem. So we, we could, in theory, remove this ground plane from here and then just study in the far field how the summation of these two fields is going to be, right? And we will come up with a, a, an equation that is going to give us the far field, electric field of this source in the presence of the ground plane uh, just by studying these two sources, right? And then just adding up the two fields. Okay, this is, I think I need to do this, or maybe not. I probably don't. Okay, so as I was mentioning, just really important to remember this, right? Oh, yeah, well, it's important. No, 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 no. Right? So always remember that the image source must provide the same polarization as the reflected wave. So it's, it's the same polarization as the reflected wave, right? Not as the, let's say, as the actual source, right? So it's the same polarization as this reflected wave here at the point in the, in the ground plane. Okay, so we have here what I was talking about, right? So this is basically just a summary. So the pink, uh, the pink notation right here is just the polarization of the, inc of the incident wave at the ground. So the blue uh, notation is just the polarization of the reflected field. And so we have that the reflected field is going to give us, uh, it's going to be thought of as it's being radiated by uh, an imaginary source or as a virtual source that is our image, our image source, right? That is going to be placed at the same distance H as our actual source from the ground plane. So the far fields or the fields at point one and two are going to be the summation of both fields of the dipoles, right? So basically just what I, I was mentioning, right? So we have our initial problem. So we have the vertical dipole here in this location at a distance h in uh, dielectric media. In this case, we're considering just vacuum. And then we have a ground plane that we consider is just infinite conductivity. So at the observation point, we can simplify this problem mathematically by removing the ground plane and then just introducing an image source that is going to give us uh, the same solution, basically, right? So some, some other examples in, in which we can use the image theory in order to simplify some problems is just to think about uh, multipath problems, right, where we have uh, a radiating antenna that is going to have a field that is going to propagate and then it's going to be reflected in, in, in different directions. So we can think, we could think at the end of those fields of being radiated also, at least the reflected waves being radiated as another uh, antenna that is at the same distance, right, from the ground point. Okay, so, so here we have some, some more examples. So in this case, we have our, our regular example of, of a, a cell tower, right? So you have the dipoles right here. These are an array of dipoles. So we have, usually you have uh, an array of dipoles oriented that in such a way that it covers certain, certain sectors of, of the, of the uh, geography. So, uh, when we are talking also about image theory, so we need also to consider uh, the orientation, right, of our, of our dipole antenna. So uh, in a simplified way, we have, uh, remember the vertical oriented dipole. This is, uh, sorry, yeah, this is the horizontal oriented dipole. And we also have magnetic, magnetic dipoles, right? So for an electric conductor, uh, or, uh, if we place the vertical dipole uh, at a distance h of the, of the ground plane, 
our image source is going to be uh, in the same direction, right? So why is that? What do you think is that? I was just mentioning it, right? We have to consider the reflected wave here at this point, right? To have the same polarization as, th as this uh, field that is going to be radiated by the by the image uh, uh, source, right? In the case of the electric dipole, uh, uh, horizontal horizontal oriented dipole, right? That we have here in the second example. So if you see that the image uh, source that we're placing for the horizontal oriented dipole is flipped, right? So why is that? Because the tangential field here needs to be zero as well, right? So the polarization of this antenna is going to be this way. So the antenna, the field that is transmitted this way and the field that is reflected this way, it has to cancel, right? The tangential component here in order for, for the tangential lead to be zero, right? For the magnetic current, so yeah. for the magnetic current, so we have here that is this image is flipped this way, and for the this is for the vert vertical magnetic dipole, and this is for the horizontal magnetic dipole, right? Mag magnetic dipole, right? So in this case, what is the boundary condition that we need to meet here? It's just the normal H, right? So this has to be zero this way, right? So they have to cancel on this interface, right? So we can also think of uh, not only perfect electric conductors, but also perfect magnetic conductors, right? So this is a PC interface, and this is a perfect magnetic conductor PMC uh, interface, right? So if you remember uh, uh, the reciprocity theorem and the equivalence uh, uh, theorem, you could replace uh, magnetic currents by with uh, uh, electric currents and find the fields uh, in that way. So equivalently here, when we think of a, ma a magnetic conductive, uh, perfect magnetic conductor interface, uh, uh, sorry. in a similar fashion, we can just replace or interchange the definitions of the orientations of our dipoles, right? So if we, ha if we have an electric dipole in the presence of uh, a magnetic conductor, so it's going to be flipped in, the sim in a similar fashion as our Magnetic dipole is flipped, right? So you can see here, the image of the electric dipole is flipped. It's in the opposite direction. The horizontal dipole is in the same direction, whereas in the magnetic uh, dipole, it's just the same as the previous case, right? OK, so why is it so important to study uh, this uh, image theory, right? Or why is it so 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 interesting and important to understand why we can replace one uh, one source with these two sources right here, right? So not only we can simplify the problem problem, but we can also study. Um, you can think of the superposition of different or extra elements that are placed in close proximity to your antenna, right? If we are assuming that there is no uh, for example, no coupling between these two elements, or we can just uh, uh, forget, at least for now, about the couplings, the coupling that might be existent between these two elements. We can study the, the far field of these uh, two dipoles, or just two dipoles placed close to each other by introducing image theory, right? So in the far field, so this is probably what is more is most important for this lecture is in the far field as we <coughs> place uh, right we place this observation point farther and farther away we can see that these r vectors right we have the r vector r1 and r2 so are pretty much the same right so as the p goes to infinity or as uh, 
the point P, the observation point, goes to infinity. We can think of these uh, distance vectors right here, the magnitude for these vectors is going to be pretty, pretty much the same, right? We can approximate R1 almost close to R2 and almost pretty much close to R, right? So, however, when we're close, we cannot do that, right? So it's, it's a little bit more complicated to study a problem like this when we have two uh, elements placed close to each other because we have to consider uh, these angles right here, right? We have to consider, consider these uh, distances are going to be considerably different, and we have to consider the different angles between this theta 2 and theta 1. This is the, the, the angle between the c-axis and the r1 uh, position vector, and theta 2 is the angle between the c-axis and the r2 position vector, right? And we have a regular theta that is from the spherical coordinate systems that is the, <coughs> the angle between the R observation vector and the, the C axis, right? So in the far field, as I was saying, right, we can think of, since we're going to be so far away from, from, from the antennas, we can think of these uh, position vectors that are being pretty close to each other. The angles are pretty much the same. However, we need to do some uh, phase approximations for, for the phase terms, right? So <coughs> we can write, at least for this graph, right, that we have right here, we can write that for the phase, R1 is going to be approximate to R minus H, H uh, cosine theta, right? And R2 is going to be R, R plus H cosine theta, right? So let me see. I don't think we have that right here. So let me see if we can understand where is that coming from, right? So maybe I can just open this. Oh, it's right here. Okay, so let's say that we have our Okay. Yep. Okay. Mm. Okay. So let's say that we have two dipoles, right? Right here, we have two vertical ori vert vertical oriented dipoles. Let's think of them as uh, infinitesimal dipoles, right? And we have the origin of our uh, coordinate system right here. So we have here, this is C, and this is Y. So we have our C axis here, so these are C oriented dipoles. So if we go here, this is our observation point. We're going to think of P turning to infinity, right? So we're far away, we're in the far field. So at the center of this dipole, we have this vector, right? So this is going to be our R1 vector, right? At the center of this dipole, we have this other vector. This is going to be R2. So maybe let's just, yeah, let's just do this. So it's a little bit better. Okay, so we're saying that we're going to be so far away in P, the observation point, right, at infinity, that these vectors are going to be pretty much parallel to each other, right? It's going to be R, right? And at some point here, they meet. So we have R1, R2, we have theta1, theta2, and we have uh, a regular theta, right? So, for we're saying that for the magnitude of the R vectors, we're going to pretty much say that R1 is pretty much close to R2, 
and close to R, or for the phase, why do you think we cannot do that approximation? So what do you see in this picture, even though that these vectors are almost parallel to each other? Why do you think that for the phase, we cannot say that just uh, R1 is pretty much close to R2 and R? So if we're going to see the length, right, if you're going to see the magnitude of this R vector compared to R1 and R2, right, we're going to have this, this small difference, right, right here between them. So this one is going to be small difference right here, and this one is going to be the difference between R1 and R2. So what is this uh, small distance right here between this point and this point? And which is a small distance between this point and this point. How, how can we cal calculate that? So we have this angle, right? We have the angle right here. This is theta, right? We're saying that theta is going to be equal to theta 1 and theta 2. And we have this angle right here, right? So basically, this is just theta, right? So we're saying theta 1 is pretty much close to theta 2 and theta. So this direction, this, this small distance right here is going to be R1, right? We have R1 minus so we have this one, right? H. So we have this here is H and this here is H. So this is going to be equal to, I'm gonna, yeah, I think I'm going to skip copying here. And let's just go back to the, to the slide, probably. So R1 is R minus H cosine of theta, and R2 is equal to R plus H cosine of theta, right? So pretty much from this, from this figure, I think you can, you can figure it out, right? So you have R2, at least for the phase, it's going to be this whole distance right here plus, like, okay. So this is going to be equal to R, right? And this is going to be equal to R1 plus this one, right? So you have R1 pretty much, you can approximate it to R minus H cosine of theta. This is just subtracting that uh, phase difference between the origin of your coordinate system or the middle point between just between your two sources and R2 R2 is going to be approximated to yeah, R plus H cosine of theta, right? So this is really important, right? So we have this approximation at least this one for the far for the amplitude terms we're going to consider the, the, the angles between the, the observation point and our antennas to be the same. And then for the phase term approximation that we usually do, we're going to use R minus H cosine theta, and R2 is going to be R plus H cosine theta, right? OK. So then if we're going to study then the far field uh, radiation from, from our actual source is going to be this, right? You already probably know this, uh, this uh, electric field by now. So this is the electric field by a, a vertical infinitesimal dipole, right? Orientated in the, in the C-axis. And then the far field radiation from the image source is going to be the same. Uh, however, we're replacing this with theta 2. You see theta 1. Theta 1 and theta 2, and we have R2 and R1. So using the approximations that we were mentioning before, right, we first apply superposition. We add the two fields together. So that's going to be our total field in the far field. And then uh, R1 is equal to R2 is equal to R. So we can extract the, the magnitude 
out of the out of this equation. And for the phase, we have this approximation right here, right? So we just uh, change R1 and R2 for, for the values that we derived before. And we have the total field. It's uh, this that we have right here. So we just have this becomes this, right? So we have this as a function of the distance that we have between the two between between the two variables, right? So this is something that after this lecture, and you're gonna see in the in the following lectures if you haven't seen them already on Canvas, right? That we're gonna denote this as the element pattern, right? So we have You can clearly see here that this field here is the same as this, right? Of these two. So this is the field or the total f or, or the electric field in the far field for a vertical uh, infinitesimal dipole, and then it's multiplied by a factor that we're calling the array factor. So that's basically the array factor of two vertical in infinitesimal dipoles at a distance h and they are vertical oriented in the c direction and they are at a distance h between each other, right? So this is the array factor right here and this is the element pattern of the array, of the, of the antenna that we have. So then you can think of if you replace the antenna, right, by, by any, ant or any other antenna that you know, even if you replace it by uh, <coughs> Uh, for example, uh, uh, a half wavelength dipole, or maybe other antenna that you're going to be studying during, during the course, you can think of an array of those two antennas that are uh, uh, placed at a distance d or h between each other. You can study those two antenna by you can study the array in a, in a similar fashion by just forgetting about the a far field of the total field of the two antennas, and they're just concentrating on the array factor, right? So you, you can calculate the array factor by considering just two antennas uh, that, are, that have any, any radiation pattern. Usually what we do is just we replace our antennas by isotropic antennas, and then we just study the array factor of isotropic antennas. We find, we find the array factor, and then with the array factor of uh, n element, uh, of antennas, we we can just multiply that array factor by the element pattern of uh, of an antenna and find how our total field is going to be when we have uh, n number of antennas, right? And obviously, so we're deriving this uh, equation for uh, a ground plane placed in the, in close proximity to our to our, well, not in close proximity, in proximity or a distance age of our of our antenna, so it's only it's, this field is only going to be valid for c uh, greater than zero, right? So we have here some if we study this equation, right? So we have here the radiation intensity, right? It's going to be this, and if we study the radiation pattern of our vert vertical oriented dipole as we increase or or decrease the distance to the ground plane, we can see on this half, right, maybe, so don't get confused by this, uh, by this figure. On this half from here, because it is symmetric, so the, the book shows one half for this value, right, for these values. So this is shown in this, uh, let's see. So the green half is for these values, and this other red half is for h equal to zero to lambda over h, and lambda over four, right? So you can start seeing as you place the antenna closer to the ground plane. Uh, in a in a sense, you can you can find that the activity is going to be, or the half power being with, uh, is uh, probably increasing, right? However, when you increase above lambda over four, maybe yeah, lambda over four, 
you start seeing some, what we call some side lobes right here, right? So you can see this other radiation pattern. It's not just uh, the one as a, as a dipole antenna that we know that is similar to a donut shape, but it has some ripples, right? Okay. So, so here, yeah. So here we have basically just a, one of the, basically a, a rule of thumb in order to find how many lobes are going to be generated. So after you increase the distance low, uh, higher than lambda over four, you, you start seeing some side lobes. So the number of lobes is going to be approximately close, something close to this, to the distance that, they, that we have from the, from the ground plane, right? Okay. So if we study the, the radiation resistance, right, of our antenna that is close to our ground plane, so we can see that at some point there is some peak directivity here. There is some minimum here of radiation resistance. So we have radiation resistance here. It's the dotted line, the continuous line is directivity. So we have a peak directivity, maximum directivity here. Then it just settles uh, at, at a value of six here. And then this is the, the distance to the ground plane. And probably what we can see here, one of the things that is really interesting, right, is how when we are closer to the ground plane, the radiation resistance is just going, like, it's just going higher and higher, right? And okay, so probably the important thing here is to note this point right here, right? So this you can think is probably uh, the optimal uh, distance that you that you want to use in order to design an antenna close to ground plane, right? Because you have the peak directivity in that point. Right? So one of the applications that we can think of the using this uh, image theory, uh, <coughs> using image theory and, and a ground plane, is we've seen how we can just think of the antenna having an image antenna that is uh, placed at a distance h, right, of our, of our ground plane, right? So if we, if we place, we already saw the, the half wavelength dipole, right? So if we place a land over four uh, monopole antenna here that is fed right here in the ground plane, you can think of the image of that antenna as being a land over four antenna, right? That it has the same uh, the same radiation pattern or the same characteristics, right? So we can think of this antenna right here, a monopole antenna with a, a land over four antenna placed at a distance h, right, of the of the ground plane and fed right here at the center, as being as the equivalent of of a land over two antenna in the in the in free space, right? So a lambda uh, monopole antenna usually is called is basically just a lambda over four antenna with a ground plane. So the equivalent of that in, in when you think of the radiation pattern of that antenna in the far field is going to be similar to a uh, a lambda over four, a lambda over two antenna in the free space, right? However, if you study the the fields here, the far field in this in this uh, in this region, you're gonna see that instead of having the donut shape, right? That we usually see for the for the land over two antenna, we'll have only something like this, right? Because there's no there's not going to be any field below the the ground plane. So one other thing about the uh, the monopole antenna is well, the radiation energy is going to be the same, so the radiator power is going to be the same as the as the dipole antenna. Uh, sorry, the 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 power, the power radiated by the monopole is going to be half uh, as the uh, as the power radiated by the by the dipole antenna. Uh, therefore, right, our input impedance is just divided by two. So the, the input impedance of the monopole antenna is pretty much half of the input impedance of a dipole antenna. So if we remember, it's close to 70, 74. 
uh, 72 for a, for a plus 40, 43 for a, for a dipole antenna. For our monopole antenna, it's going to be half of that. And we can just see that the directivity is going to be doubled, right? Because even though the, the radiation intensity is going to be studied as the same for both, the radiator power is going to be half for the monopole, right? So we're reducing the input impedance by half, and we are therefore increasing the directivity of our, dip of our monopole by two. So pretty much we have 3.29, uh, so it's close to 5.16 uh, dBs, right? So just a 3 dB, right, increase as compared to the Landover to dipole antenna. So some examples, right? Uh, what time is it? Let's see. Yeah. Okay, so some examples of monopole antennas or dipole antennas using mobile devices. So we have uh, uh, the use of walkie-talkies that we, we previously saw in the past, some old cell, phone and cell phones that you probably don't see anymore, that we had the, the antenna that was sticking out of the, of the cell phone. So more walkie-talkies. So uh, the famous Nokia, I think, phone. It was pretty, pretty hard phone. So, so we transition from this to no dipole antenna. Well, actually, we have some dipole antennas inside this, this, uh, this uh, cell phone right here and in today's smartphone. So we have pretty much something similar. We have some dipole antennas where they're modified in some ways in order to uh, work at, at different bands. So probably you'll, some of you will have if you decide to do the 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 cat uh, project that we have for for the final uh, for the final cat project of the course is going to include probably some uh, antennas that are, are usually designed for for uh, mobile devices so depending if you decide to take it at least for undergrads i think it's going to be optional for graduate students uh, probably it's going it's not going to be optional so you'll have at least undergrads will have i think uh, that's what I, Dr. Munch and I have talked so far. I think you'll have the option between doing a, probably a, a literature survey or just opting out for doing something else. So, some other applications for, for antennas. So, we have here this a wide band antenna, a wide band uh, monopole. So, printed with this is a, just a CPW, and then we have the antenna. So, this is a coplanar waveguide for those of you that don't know. So CPW is because well we have a, this is just a ground right here and this is where the signal is flowing. So why is this a uh, wideband uh, monopole? Because it just it's just a fat dipole. You just you can see that the 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 width of this or, or just the yeah the width of, of the dipole is just increased in order to have. Uh, just a wideband performance. You will see that when you, in, the, in the wideband and in the broadband antenna lectures, right? And our Wi-Fi is, well, some similar, similar monopole antennas. So as I was mentioning before, we have an ar array of dipoles, usually uh, oriented, oriented to, towards the sector in order to cover, uh, the, in order to, to provide cell phone coverage to different sectors, uh, usually at different frequencies sometimes close to each other with just different channels. And so now if we study our horizontal oriental dipole, right? So <coughs> these, you can think of this horizontal oriented dipole as the Y oriented dipole, or maybe the X oriented dipole that you, I think you solve for the, for the homework, the Y oriented dipole, I think, or the X, I think it's the Y, right? Yeah, I think it's a wise. So probably you already know the field of this uh, of this uh, of this antenna, right? So we take the same far field uh, approximations for our uh, image theory case, right? So we forget about the ground plane. We place an image antenna, an image source, right here, at distance h from the ground plane. So we study in the far field. So R1 is pretty much the same in magnitude, or we approximate that it's going to be pretty much the same. But we take this difference, right? So this right here 
is going to be the difference that we're taking from R1 mi minus R2, and this one is going to be this difference right here, right? So if you see, this distance is the same, and this distance right here is the one that we have to take in order to match the face of this, uh, of this terms right here. So remember, always for the phase terms, we need to actually study how the uh, antennas are placed between each, between each other, and then study. Uh, just it's just basic geometry, right? Just take some what is it, what is this distance that we're going to subtract from uh, uh, r in order to obtain uh, r as a function as a function of r one or r one as a function of r. And then what are the distances we, that we need to subtract from R2 in order to approximate the phase term of R with the phase term of R2, right? Okay. So we already solved this. So probably you already know this. Uh, this I'm going to go over this quickly. So we start by our integral equation, right? We find the a. We find the a uh, a vector, right? So we integrate the oriental dipole, uh, y-oriented dipole, yeah. So we approximate this in the far field. We find that this integral and just reduces to this. So this is going to be our A field, right? You have to transform this, obviously, to spherical coordinates. So we use the, or the sorry. So this is just the transformation. So. We take a theta and a, a phi for the fields, and we have these fields, right? So we have e theta and e phi for the horizontal oriented dipole. So we're going to call this, and probably if, you, if you've seen the book, you can see that uh, Professor Balanis calls this term as a psi, psi hat, right? So this is basically the, the orientation of the dipole in, in uh, let's say, in, in, the, in the y direction, right? So this term, so, so don't get confused that, so this term has probably just uh, a derivation that it, you, can, you can just, you can just take this term and then just place it also in, in in an x-oriented dipole, so it's not going to be the same term, right? It's not, it's not going to be the same. You can call it psi hat, but psi hat is not going to be equal for both x-oriented and y-oriented dipole, right? So that's what I'm saying. So since we know this field is going to be this, or it's going to be something similar to this, so in the far field, we can think of taking the radiated field of this dipole antenna, right? So we have the horizontal dipole antenna, uh, number one, and we have the horizontal dipole antenna number two. So we have C, C hat what C hat one, C hat two, and we have R one, R two. So we have we can apply superposition for both, and then with some mathematical derivation, right? We can we can arrive to something similar, right, that we had before. So by replacing R one and R two with the far field approximation of our uh, image theory case, uh, we have r minus h cosine theta, and in this case is r plus h cosine theta. And we have, we can extract from here this term, so we have that this guy is going to be the element pattern of an horizontal dipole, and this is going to be the array factor, right, of those two dipoles uh, placed at a distance h from the ground plane. Right, so this is also valid only for C greater than zero, right? So if we study this, we have something similar, right, to what we saw uh, for the vertical-oriented dipole, right? However, in this case, we can see, right, we have the vertical-oriented dipole, right? So it's going to have the donut shape, like on this case. However, for <coughs> For the ground plane, right? We don't have this part, right? Since we have the ground plane. So th this is the same or a similar figure that before. So we have this green a section for this part. 
and we have this red section for these values, right? So this half of the this half plane is for the red section right here, and this other half plane is for the red for the green section. So you can see that as after we increase h over land over four, some side lobes start to appear as well, right? So we have some approximation two over here. So <coughs> sorry. And some other thing that you will see is that uh, at least for this case, for the vertical uh, horizontal oriented eyeball, sorry, this pattern is not symmetric for different uh, phi uh, uh, positions, right, or, or values. You can probably see that more in a, a 3D uh, <coughs> representation of the uh, radiation pattern right here, right? So you can see that this, this uh, if you take uh, a C cut, in, if you take any C cut on this, or some C cuts on the, of this, uh, of this variation pattern is not going to be symmetric, at least in, in all the in, in the whole uh, locations, right? So yeah. so this is for h equal to lambda, right? So you can start seeing the the side lobes appearing from the radiation pattern. Uh, radiation uh, resistance, <coughs> we can study the radiation resistance similarly. So basically, we just radiate, we find the radiated power. And we find the directivity, right, for the for the dipole antenna. So we have uh, that this is for different h values between uh, smaller than lambda over four between lambda over four and p over two, I think. Yeah. yeah. So smaller than lambda over four. Yeah. And this one is just for values greater than lambda over four. <coughs> So if we plot this, yeah. yeah, if we plot this, uh, sorry. if we plot the radiation resistance and the directivity of the antenna uh, as the height, as the height of the the, the 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 dipole is changed from the ground plane, we can see that the radiation resistance, that is the dotted line, is initially zero, right, and then goes goes to a peak, and then it just oscillates around the value, right? And then the directivity uh, here goes to a minimum here, right? Because we have maximum radiation resistance here, right here, and then oscillates also and settles around the value. So probably one interesting thing is that if you study this equation, right, and you see what happens as uh, gauge tends to zero, that is, that we pretty much just uh, reduce the distance between the, the, the horizontal dipole and the, and the ground plane. It's just we're getting the, the, the antenna close to the ground plane. Basically, just we're shorting just the actual source, right? OK, here we have some, so this is the, the horizontal uh, oriented dipole, right? So we have some input impedance variation. So we have here. Input impedance. We have uh, different values of uh, conductivities for the for the ground plane. So here we have no ground. So here we have uh, different values, and we can see how <coughs> uh, for the land over two dipole right here. Yeah. So this one here. So this one right here, the top one, is the the real part, right, of our uh, input impedance, and this top, this bottom part right here is the imaginary part. This is the reactance, right? So you can see how basically just begins at a really high value, right? And then it settles here at a, at a value of close to 73 ohms and 42.5. So that is pretty much close to the, the lambda over two dipole antenna that we know, right? So you can see as you increase the, the distance between the ground plane, it's just pretty much as if the antenna is no longer seeing the ground plane, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that is pretty much the lecture for today, but 
So let's go over quickly. Uh, I think we have some time. We have around, I think the lecture is 10.45, right? So we have, so if we started a bit late because of the door. It was closed, so we, we had it. We're waiting for it to get fixed. So we're, we'll try to go over. I, I don't know if some of you have, I, I think somebody was emailing me about the CAD assignment. Well, not, not about the CAD assignment, but just about having problems installing the software, but I think he's not here today, maybe. So do any of you have any problems installing the software? Do you have any questions about the software? Or are you guys all okay with the software? Okay. So maybe, okay, let's just probably, let me see. Let's go over Canvas. Let's download quickly the, the CAD assignment. or to the modules. So if you haven't done it yet, I probably would highly recommend that you go over the tutorial. So let's just, let's just go over the tutorial really quick. So we, if you go here into CAD1, you can see that we have these, uh, we have these, uh, these links right here for you. So you have how to install the GFSS. You can go through it. I think most of you have uh, uh, probably already, ha already have the software. Right? If you don't, probably just go ahead and install it. And so here we have, uh, let me see, yeah. So let me just open this. Yeah. So this semester we'll be using, this will be the first semester that we're using uh, HFSS. So previously in the past we were using ABS to do the simulations. So the advantage of HFSS or ANSI CDT, how it's called right now, is that we can pretty much model the three D geometry, right, of the antenna, of the whole antenna. So you can read this, and the, there are some just basic comments on how the the software uh, do the calculations. It's just basically the finite element method, and you also it also uses some like some more uh, like physical optics, and also has some method of moments for large scale uh, geometries, but. Most of the time, we'll be focusing on, on the solver with the final element method solver. So if you go through this, you will see that you have how to uh, just do some basic geometry uh, uh, drawings, right? So you can basically just draw two cylinders. As you have right here, you can draw a cylinder that's going to represent your, your wire dipole antenna. This is going to be mostly, I would advise you to review this, at least this tutorial right here for the second card that is going to be based on a wire dipole antenna. So you'll be using this, uh, this design procedure on how to uh, design your wire dipole for this case. It's pretty much usually useful to do this, like when you're designing your antenna, you can assign some variables you can create the geometry and you can assign variables, as you can see here and here. You can assign variables to the, to the lengths or the geometry, so that you can easily change the geometry when you're done. And if, so this is the first part. It's just a wire dipole antenna in free space. You can see that we have solved this and you can see the donut shape Web that we've seen in the course, right? Or that you already know. So this is a, a return loss uh, characteristics of the of the antenna. So the second one is mostly the one that is going to concern to you for the first CAD assignment, right? So this is just a half wavelength dipole antenna, but it's just a print, printed dipole antenna. So HFSS now has some. Uh, pretty neat features, so you can use some wizards to automatically create your, your geometries. However, for the first two CAD assignments, we're not letting you use those. At least recommending not to use it, because you'll need to do some changes that if you, you know the software pretty much, uh, you won't be able to, or, or you're going to be a little bit lost on doing it 
automatically than in just doing it by hand uh, as is recommended on the on the on the tutorial, right? So probably after, well, at least for the second part of the cut as, of the second cut, you will be able to use the wizards, and pretty much for this for the rest of the of the assignments, you will be able to use the wizards. So this example has the it, it shows you how to use a wizard. You won't be able to use it for the first cut assignment, so you probably, if you've done CAD design before, you'll be fine. If you haven't, just follow this procedure right here for the wire dipole antenna. It's gonna be it's going to be pretty much the same for the printed dipole, only that you have to draw a box for the substrate and then show just some strips for the dipole antenna, right? So at the end, you're going to have a, a geometry that is pretty much something like this, right? You'll have the substrate, and you'll have pretty much like a PCB board, like a PCB, right? A printer circuit board. And you're going, to have, you're going to have some metal strips, right? So when you solve this, uh, when you solve your, 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 your file with, with the geometries uh, explained in the, in the CAD assignment, you'll have, or you should have, something close to this, right? So I would recommend that you go through the through the tutorial. So let's just quickly probably just review the first CAD assignment, and maybe if you have any questions, you can you can take advantage that I am right here, and you can ask me. So this is due next week on the 22nd. So if you haven't started, uh, I, again, I would stress that you start getting started, you, st you start getting uh, working on this because if you don't have experience with HFSS, you might find it a little bit like uh, yes. yeah, a little bit difficult for you maybe to understand what you're doing. So we have. So if you read the if you read the assignment, we have basically basically just a substrate with a printed single uh, a PCB, right? It's just a strip dipole here printed. Dipole length, you know how to find it, right? This is going to be basically just a land over two dipole, right? So you will know your uh, resonance frequency by the last number of your USF U number, right? So since we have uh, a large amount of students, so this year we decided just to give you different designs so you can just compare at the end and see if, if you have, if the things that you've simulated, even though you're doing it at different frequencies, uh, matches, right, what you're, what you're doing. So see if it makes sense, uh, the things that you're doing. So we have some parameters right here for the substrate, right, so substrate dimension. So just follow these, uh, these recommendations, so don't do like, at less than 1.5 times the length, right? And the substrate, it has to be at least two times the dipole length, so just keep that in mind when you're selecting your dimensions in the x direction and the, in the y direction, right, for your, for your substrate. And your dipole is gonna be pretty much a, a, a strip, right? So, what is this, okay. So pretty much what you you will be doing is finding the isometric. You you'll be doing a, a, a write up right of your design approach. How did you design the dipole? Why did you design the length that you had initially? And if you optimize the length, why did you do it? And what did you see right after you you change the length? And current distribution of the dipole. What are you seeing at your resonance frequency? How can you find the current distribution? Well, that if you've worked with ABS, probably it's easier to do with ABS. But if you haven't done it with HFSS, so that's right here in the, to in the tutorial, right? So if you don't know how to do it, instead of going through the help file and finding out how to do it, I would recommend you just go through a tutorial at least once. If you don't wanna just go step by step, maybe just at least read it, understand it, and then if you have, if you're stuck in a step here in the or, or in one of the questions that you're getting here, you can always go through a tutorial and see that.
probably something that we're asking here is already been done in the tutorial and, you, and you'll know how to do it. Okay? So I don't know if you guys have any questions. I was planning on doing an exercise, but I don't think we'll have time. Probably I uh, can give you guys something to think about uh, insert blank page. Yeah. So something interesting to do, like uh, you guys already solve uh, a lot of different dipoles, right? So if you have some free time, uh, you probably, all of you have a lot of free time. So, <laughs> so some, something that is pretty much interesting in order to study like any oriented dipole in any, any uh, a dipole oriented in any direction, right? So if you have, for example, this is a C, uh, let's just say that this is Y to make it simple, and this is X, and you have this angle right here. So how can you find a dipole that is oriented in any direction, right? So far you've seen that, at least for the, if this is X and Y, at least for the X-oriented dipole, right? No, let's just change this to, yeah, right. If this is a dipole for the Y-oriented dipole, at the end we, ha we find a field that is just a magnitude field times Y hat, right? Something similar to this, and this is just uh, a magnitude value, right? And then we just transform these to uh, uh, spherical coordinates, right? Now for the case, I can do this, okay. For the case of a X-oriented dipole, right? So if we have this, it's pretty much the same, right? Something similar to this, at least to Okay, something similar to this, right? It's just a magnitude times x hat, right? So let's say that by you can deduce in a way, right? Without doing any math, at least at the beginning, you can prove it with math at the end, that maybe, depending on the current magnitude, of this uh, of this dipole that is oriented right in any direction, or at least let's forget about now any direction. Let's just say uh, it has a. You can decompose this dipole into two dipoles, right? Or this current into two into two dipole currents. One current that is oriented in the x direction, and one current that is orient is. Uh, uh, oriented in the y direction. And the magnitude is just the magnitude of this vector right here, right? So you could say that this uh, dipole that is oriented in any direction is going to have a field at the far field, right? That is just the magnitude of something, right? Of an E field times just x hat plus y hat, or at least Something close to that is going to be the unit vector, right? The, the component of the component of the unit vector of this vector that we have right here, right? Are you following me? So the unit vector, or let's say u, for example, the orientation of the dipole is going to be a unit vector called u, u hat, that is going to have a y component, uh, sorry, an x component and a y component, right? So you could find a dipole that is oriented in the in basically in the x in the x y plane in the c y plane or in the c x plane just by decomposing the currents into into components or by finding the dipole uh, orientation right with a vector. If you go more, if you want to go more general, right, you can go to x y and c and find a dipole oriented in space in, with the same procedure, right? Just decompo decomposing the, the corners of the dipole in three components that are oriented along the, the three magnitudes. And then transform, obviously, at the end, you, you always remember to transform that x hat and y hat to spherical coordinates, right? OK. So any questions? So you just 
have like a component in the current in both the directions and you add the radiation patterns from those individual antennas? Yeah, you can you can do that. Just superpose superimpose both. Yeah. So if I know the radiation patterns for X, Y, and Z, I'm like pretty much good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> just just you have to be careful it's just with the magnitude of the current and yeah, right. yeah because you have to decompose that into a unit vector mm -hmm. so you have to be careful of the magnitude of the vector in the y direction and the magnitude of the vector in the x direction right so maybe in order to make that clear clearer so if you think of this this is y and x right so if you are 45 degrees, right? This vector v is going to have the same magnitude for x. This is vx, and this is vy, right? Right? Where v is equal to vx plus vy, right? If it's 45 degrees here, these two magnitudes are going to be the same, right? If you change the, the, the angle, maybe Vx, the magnitude of Vx is higher, and the magnitude of Vy is higher, is lower, sorry. If you, if you, can I go down? I can do this, yeah. So you have these two vectors, right? They give you this vector. So now you have this vector. So this magnitude is bigger than this one, right? So that's what I'm saying. You have to be careful on how you assign the magnitudes to each component yeah. when you're decomposing the, the vectors. But basically, you can decompose this, as I was saying, into a u hat. And then this is, is this is not going to be um, anymore a unit vector, right? It's going to be the y component of this unit vector, and x, y is going to, and x is going to be the x component of that unit vector. So they're no longer unit vectors; they're just the y and, and x component of a unit vector, right? And I also, you also have to project the length of the right? Just do it mathematically, and you will see that uh, it's. It's pretty, it, yeah. At the end, the length is just the length of the dipole times the, you can think of the current of, because you don't have length, right? You have I0 times uh, the orientation of the current, right? So this is in the current, it's not in the length. The length of the dipole is going to be the same always. So. Can I just like define a new coordinate system and give you the z where you dipole radiation patterns? <laughs> yeah, I don't think Dr. Uh, Mush yeah. is gonna take that. <laughs> yeah. So you'll have to you'll have to do it in the you'll have to prove him which one is your transformation into a spherical yeah. coordinate. Yeah. So I guess. Okay. Okay, I think.